Today we're going to talk about how to thrive in the ruins. But before we do that, let's take a little break and scroll through social media, shall we? <laughs> oh look, that's my friend Gigi. Go back one. She just had her first grandbaby, and it says, meet my first grandbaby, Audrey Wren, seven pounds, 21 ounces. God, that's so good. Amen. What's next? Oh, Penny Lane. She just closed on her new home. So blessed. Next is Shelby. Fine, oh, I like her new car. Finally, loving my new ride. Thank you, Jesus. Favor. And Tanya, all that studying paid off. Today she graduated with honors. He is faithful. And then there's my friend Rena. She just started her new job with better pay, excellent benefits, and she gets to work from home. Won't he do it? It's not unusual to go on social media and see those kind of posts, right? That's the kind of post we see on social media. And that's because when we are on the mountaintop and we are experiencing a blessing, it's really easy to say, God, you are so good. You are so faithful. Thank you, Lord. But what do we do when life takes a turn, we get hit with a curveball, and all of a sudden we find ourselves in a pit of heartache? Do we still say, God, you are so good. You are so faithful. Thank you. I'm used to seeing updates like this on Facebook and Instagram. But one day, I saw a post that stopped me in my tracks. It was a friend of mine from high school. I hadn't seen him or talked to him in years. And he was posting status updates each day about his wife. She was in the hospital at Duke. And she had been in the hospital for several months. And the doctors did not feel like there was much more that they could do. And so every day he went on social media and he gave an update of her status. And one day when I first read the post, I read everything he wrote and then at the very bottom in big letters, like all capitalized, he said, but God, you are so good. And that struck me. Like how could he do that? How could anyone worship God like that in the middle of the ruins. So I started looking back at all of his posts. He had been posting every day and every single post. Some were desperate, some were sad, some were overwhelming, but they all ended with, but God, you are so good. Have you ever experienced messy ruins? Maybe it was grief or trauma, shame, a job loss, an illness, depression, an injury, finances, betrayal, addiction, watching our kids suffer, losing a friend, divorce. My friend's updates about his wife were so desperate. And yet, he continued to point to God and say, but God, you are so good. Plus, he's praising God, and he's doing it daily on social media. And it really made me think about what it looks like to thrive in the ruins. But before we go there, let's look at what is not thriving in the ruins. And to do that, we're going to look at a story in the Bible about a beautiful princess named Tamar. So you find the story in 2 Samuel 13. She's a beautiful virgin. She's the daughter of the king. And she had a brother. His name was Amnon. And he was obsessed with her. He was so obsessed with her that he created a scheme and had pretended like he was sick and had her make food to bring it to him. Only when she went into the room to bring it to him, he overpowered her and humiliated her and he raped her. 
If that wasn't bad enough, he also said to her, get out, go away. He hurt her and then he threw her away. She didn't hide her pain. When that happened, she ripped the beautiful robe she was wearing. She put ashes on her forehead to show her grief. She had both of her arms in the air, wailing, wailing out to God. Her other brother, Absalom, saw her, and he said, Was Amnon with you? Be quiet, my sister. He's your brother. Don't take it so seriously. In another translation, in the NIV, it actually says, he says, hey, don't take this thing to heart. So she did. And what we find is that she lived in her brother Absalom's house as a desolate woman. What does desolate mean? It means isolated, alone, without hope, abandoned, solitary, not having friends, like she is all by herself. Tamar was in the ruins for sure, but she was not thriving. She was desolate. She was without hope. Someone who should have cared for her brutally harmed her, and the response was, shh, be quiet. Don't take it to heart. Have you heard similar words? Don't say things like that. You need to get over it. That was a long time ago. Don't you tell a soul. He's your blame. <coughs> Dad, brother, uncle, grandpa, fill in the blank. Just try not to think about it. Those words are so damaging, and they lead to desolation. We can't, we can't just act like it never happened, stuff it down, and think that everything is going to be okay. That is not how we thrive. That leads to desolation. So now that we know what not thriving looks like, what does thriving look like? A little bit of my story, I was sexually abused throughout my childhood, and I hid the secrets for most of my life. My abuser said, do not tell a soul, and I didn't. I hid the secrets from everyone. I even thought I was hiding them from God. We know we can't do that, right? But I thought I was hiding them from God, because whether he knew it or not, I didn't bring it up with him, and it was not a part of our relationship. That pain from the abuse made me do awful things, and it led me down a path that caused me to encounter even more shame. I made bad choices, and I numbed all of that pain by using drugs and alcohol, which led to even more bad choices, more shame, more pain, all of it ruins. One morning, after a night of being out partying, I blacked out again, and when I woke up, I was on hardwood floors, and this morning was different. This morning I felt so desperate, so sad, and I cried out to God. God, I am so sorry. Please help me. I don't want to be this way. I don't want to do these things. God, help me. He heard my cry, and he rescued me, and he answered. My life started to clean up. I stopped doing drugs, I stopped going out, I stopped drinking, and I started going to church and learning more about God. And I also learned how to be a good girl, you know? Started doing the right things with the right people. And I started to develop what I affectionately call my checklist. Did I go to church? Check. Yes, I did. Did I read my Bible today? Check. I read my Bible. Did I pray? Yes, I prayed. Did I say the blessing? 
check, sometimes check, 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 and then check and check. Because you know how praying before meal is for me. Um, so I worked through a lot of the shame from the things that I did, from the bad decisions that I made. But that sexual abuse stuff, mm -mm, no way. That was off limits, locked away deep down in the recesses of my heart. And it continued to pump shame throughout every fiber of my being. I didn't go there with God. I was like Tamar. I stayed quiet and I didn't take it to heart. I built walls around my heart that kept people out, kept me in, and even God couldn't access those walls of my heart. They were walled in. I was doing all the right things on the outside, but on the end, there was a boundary. And I thought I was doing all the right things. I thought I was worshiping him and doing everything he wanted me to do. But I was living the biggest lie with my husband, with my family, and with God. It didn't matter how perfect the outside of my life looked. On the inside, it was so painful and desperate and hollow. There was so much shame. I could feel it in my body, head to toe. I could feel it. But I continued to smile and pretend like everything was fine because that was all I had learned to do. But God, he is so good. And after crying out, he gave me the courage to speak up, to get the help that I need. And when I was almost 40 years old, I'm almost 50. When I was almost 40 years old, about 10 years ago, he led me to a Christian counselor, and I started telling her all of my secrets, one by one. And we went through all of that disgust that was in my heart, and I discovered that God already knew. He knew all of this already. He was with me the entire time. I gave him access to all the darkness, all the dark places, and he poured his healing and his love into each and every wound. And he taught me that a lot of the lies, I had lived with lies, because when you're isolated like that and you are desolate and you're hiding stuff, there's a lot of this going on. And it's telling you you're no good, you're not worthy, um, God doesn't love you, if he loved you this would be happening to you, so many lies. And as I sat with that counselor and we went through my history and we went through the word, we replaced all of those lies with truth. I am a masterpiece. He loves me. He has great plans for me. He created me in the womb for great things. He has a purpose for my life. And those checklists, oh my goodness, the only checklist he was after the entire time was the truth. In John 4, 14, 4, 24, I told you I'm not with the dresses. In John 4, 24, it says, God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and truth. He wanted all of it, all of the truth. No hiding, no shame. So what about you? Do you have a checklist? Is there a part of your past that you keep separate from your interactions with God? If you're working on your checklist and you're hiding a part of you and a part of your past from God, today is the day. You can let that light shine in. It'll shine into that darkness. He already knows. You're not telling him something he didn't already know. The enemy would love for you to sit and hold it all in, walk out, not say anything, not do anything, but Christ came to set you free. So have you talked to Jesus about everything? Is there something that's lingering in the shadows that's off limits? What happens when you give God access to the dark places? Once I gave him access, he helped me replace the lies with truth and everything that was stuffed in my heart came out and it came through his filter. He removed the shame. I don't feel that anymore. If you know what it feels like, it really feels like someone has taken a bucket of warm glue and they've poured it over you. 
Like when you're experiencing it in the moment, that's what it felt like to me. I was just covered in this thick warm blue. And I don't feel that anymore, and it is such a blessing, and I'm so grateful. I also discovered his love for me. I didn't feel loved. It was hard for me to believe. I believe he loves you, yes. Me? Hmm. Not so much. But I know he loves me, and I know I'm his daughter, and I know his love for me is unconditional. If I don't check off my list, that's not what he's after. He's after my heart. And after sitting with him in the darkness, suddenly I was starting to wanting to tell my secrets. Like I wanted others to be set free. So the girl who was so secretive and could hide all of these secrets is now like wanting to tell people my story and tell people my secrets so that they too could experience freedom. Once I laid it out, I was like, God, I want to tell my story. I'll tell my story. He knows our entire story from beginning to end. And maybe like me, you've experienced things in your childhood that made you take a path that was maybe not a good path, and you made bad decisions. God knows that. He knows that better than anyone. No one understands that like Jesus. You know when you see someone and they're making bad decisions and they're, they're doing something wrong and our natural instinct is to judge, right? We don't know what they've been through. We don't know what they go home to every afternoon. We have no idea what people live with. God does. He knows. So he has so much grace for me in all of those moments where I did the wrong thing with the wrong people at the wrong time. He knew. He knew what I'd been through, he knew what I was going through, and he knew why I was doing it. He has grace that we can't even begin to capture. We want to, but his grace is so big. So if there's an area in your life today, past or present, that feels like ruins, will you let him in? Will you give him access to the hardest parts of your story? Will you talk to him about your feelings and what you're thinking so that he can help you see the truth? The verse doesn't say God is spirit and his worshipers must worship him with a checklist of good Christian girl things. That's not what it says. It says God is spirit and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. He wants all of your heart, especially the ruins. Where other people may not want to hear it, may not want to sit with it, he is there, always. There's nothing you can say that's going to be like, whoa, I have no idea. He knows. He's the greatest listener. Now, can I be really transparent? <laughs> Back in 2019, in December, I told God, you know, I want to share my story. I want to help women be free. And the reason is because I know what it was like to not know how to be free. What do you do? How do I get there? I know what it was like to sit there and wish that someone would talk about this stuff and someone would point to Jesus and find God in this. And so um, in December of 2019, I've been writing my story and writing my book. And in 2019, I was like, God, I will share my story however you see fit with whoever you want me to share my story with. Let's do it. And then the bottom fell out. Isn't that what happens? Um, COVID hit, so we're all in isolation. My business that my husband and I ran for 23 years was suddenly, unexpectedly, up for sale. Our finances changed overnight. I went back to school to get my master's in pastoral counseling. Not in the plan. None of this was in my plan. I had a plan to share my story, but God, I want to do it this way. He's taken me on a wild ride. Um, in addition to that, my children have had eight surgeries, several ER visits um, in the last two years. It's just been a whirlwind. And I could I've been in and out of the doctor's office for chronic pain and hair loss. I could go on and on and just tell you ruin after ruin after ruin. 
But you get the point. It has, a, it has a been easy. And even though I've said, God, I want to share my story, and I'll do whatever you want me to do, it doesn't mean that it's easy. And there's been so many days in the last two years where I felt like I was in the ruins. In fact, it was one of those days I was at my lowest when I came across my friend Michael's post on Facebook and I saw that he was in a hard place. He couldn't even see his wife because of COVID-19. He was having to get updates from the nurses and the doctors and then report on Facebook. He wasn't able to be by her side. His situation was so desperate. And I saw him post about this and say, but God, you are so good. I knew God was good. There was no doubt. I knew God was good. But when you are in the ruins, it doesn't always feel like God is good. And if you've ever read the Psalms, you will see that it is completely acceptable, A-OK, -okay, to cry out to God when you're in the ruins. He can handle it. I want to look at an example in Psalm 13. I have it here. I can read it to you. And this is when David's crying out to God. It was actually in my Bible I planned this morning, the same verse, but it was a different translation, and I wish I'd used that translation because it was so powerful. So it's NET if you want to look it up, Psalm 13. But the version I put here is NIV. And this is what David says. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? But then if you go a little bit further, verse 5, he says, But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. David did it, and we can too. I did it. In that moment, I was like, God, why are you doing this to me? Why is this happening to me? Where are you? I'm right here. Do you trust me? Yes? Do you trust me to provide for you? Do you trust me to protect you and to protect your children? Do you trust me to take care of everything? Can you let go of that desire to be in control and truly trust me? These are just a few of the issues that I'm working through. We're all a work in progress. And he's teaching me how to trust, especially in the ruins. In the Bible, it says, in this world, you will have trouble. I wish it said, in this world, you will not have trouble and you will not have pain. But that's not how it reads. In John 16, it says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. So how do we thrive in the ruins? We take heart. And what does take heart mean? In some of the other translations, instead of saying take heart, it says take courage, be brave, do not fear, cheer up, be of good comfort, have confidence, be undaunted, be certain. We take heart because we already know that Jesus has overcome the world. There's already victory. He's already won the battle. That's how we take heart. And as you consider your ruins and what you're going through, are you taking heart? Are you being brave and courageous and undaunted, knowing that you can trust him with everything? He already knows and the battle is already won. Have you given him full access to your story and to your ruins? In Tamar's story, her brother told her on the worst day of her life, hey, don't take this thing to heart. 
So she stuffed it down, put it away, and lived as a desolate woman. But here's the thing. God did not create us to be desolate women. Amen. I don't know what your ruins look like, but I know that you're not alone. You can be brave and take heart. You can be courageous. You can sit with Jesus in the rubble and share your heart with him and give him access to your story and your deepest hurts. Because in this world, we will have trouble. We will find ourselves in the ruins. But as believers, we know how the story ends. We know there's victory. Lastly, your ruins are never wasted. When we thrive in the ruins, our story makes an impact on others, and it shines the light of Jesus into their darkness, into their desperation. When my friend Michael was pouring his heart out on social media every day and declaring, God, you are so good, that's something I will never forget. And when I find myself gloomy occasionally, that comes to mind now, but God, you are so good. His story affected so many people. More and more people were reading his updates and hearing him daily. He would have a Bible verse sometimes too, proclaiming the goodness of God in his sorrow. We were made to thrive in Jesus, mind, body, and spirit. With all of our heart, we have to worship him in spirit and in truth. That's all of our heart. In Deuteronomy 6, 5, it says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. We may find ourselves in the ruins, but we have Jesus. There's so many people that are in the ruins, and they don't know Jesus. They have heartache, but they don't have hope. That's why sharing our story is so important. I don't talk about my past because I enjoy talking about it. Honestly, I don't. It's hard. It's hard. It's emotionally hard. It's mentally and physically hard to do. But it's so important. I know how desperately I needed to hear those words. And I'm going to go on script a minute. I went to a conference. It was my first conference with this church back in 1997, 98. And I was with a group of ladies, sitting in a pew. And the speaker started talking about things. And she shared about her bad decisions. Totally could relate. I was coming out of that. God was working in my heart. I was trying not to make bad decisions. Totally understood. And then she brought up how she had been sexually abused as a child. That was the one and only time I had ever heard it mentioned in a church. She mentioned it. As soon as she said it, woo, like all these alarms were going off in me, and all the voices got really, really loud. Don't say anything, don't say anything, don't say anything. It's not going to happen for you. Whatever happened for her, it's never going to happen for you. Those were the voices. And so... When it was over, I zipped my mouth and I walked out and I never said a word. That was the one time that I heard it and I had a chance to say something, get help, speak up, cry out, take heart, but I didn't. The noises, the voices, and the noise in my head, it was too loud. Shut me up, silence, again. God doesn't give up on us. Even then, he continued to pursue me. And like I said, when I was almost 40, he put things in place for me to share my story. So I share that because don't listen to those voices. If you're hearing voices in your head telling you it's not going to happen for you, it's going to happen for you. He loves you. You're his daughter. He wants nothing more than for you to be set free. And you may not hear sermon on Tamar for the rest of your life. You, you may not hear people talk about sexual abuse in church, but God cares. He cares a lot. 
He cares about romance, not just sexual abuse, but all romance. But if there's anything that's holding you back, you are in a safe place today. You are encouraged today. We will pray with you. We will care for you. Don't be afraid to cry out, speak up, get the help you need, and take heart and be brave. Back on script. Um, <laughs> but that's why sharing our story is so important. I knew how much I needed to hear it, and now you know why I needed so desperately to hear it. And I also knew that so many other women were suffering in silence and shame and needed to hear it. Are you thriving in the ruins? Are your ruins bringing hope to others? Ruins, they're heavy and they're hard. If you are in the ruins right now, we're gonna do something a little different. I'm gonna have um, Susan come up and just play a song or play the music. We're gonna just be quiet for a little bit. And as she plays, I'm not gonna ask you to get up out of your seat and come forward, but if you're in the ruins, any of the ruins, divorce, addiction, children, you, you know your ruins. I'm not, it doesn't have to be sexual abuse, but if you are in the ruins and you want to cry out today to Jesus, he is here, he will meet you. All you have to do, as Susan plays, is just raise your hand. One of us will come to you, we'll pray with you, and we'll pray over you, and we will be with you. You don't have to be alone in your suffering. You don't have to be alone. If you are in the ruins now, cry out. Speak up. Get the help you need. And take heart. Be brave. Take heart, ladies. Take heart. God is so good. And he created you to thrive. <laughs>